All right. Hey, Mel, how are you? I'm wonderful, Melissa. How are you? I am doing fabulous. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Reawakened Mom podcast. I'm excited to have my listeners hear from you and learn so much from you. Well, and I'm excited to be here and excited to share. So thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So I want to tell um, the listeners a little bit about you. So Mel is a longtime working mom. She's a wife and entrepreneur. She first hired a coach to become a better leader at work, actually, and found that it also made her a better parent. She is now helping other parents learn to help keep their cool and communicate so their kids will listen better. Her ultimate mission, which I love this, is to build a new emotionally healthy and happy generation from the ground up and believes that this is how parents can change the world. One beautiful child at a time. So thank you for being here. That is like, that is amazing. We can dive right into all of that right now. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for being here. I would love to just know how did, so you, you talked a little bit in your bio about that, you know, you first hired a coach while you were working. So obviously you, you were doing some kind of career before you were doing what you are doing now. What were you doing? So I started, oh gosh, I started a company back in 2001 when my son was six months old. I originally thought I was going to be a stay at home mom and my husband knew better. (laughs) It just didn't suit me. And so I decided to, we started a staffing company. So I had been a technical recruiter, started a staffing company. And then in 2015, we started a healthcare division and I eventually became the CEO running that company. So that just, it grew it just grew and had a life of its own. I like to say it was kind of like my third child. And, (laughs) but, because I just was driven. I love to learn, I love to grow. I actually really like growing companies. There was all that with it. But the, I think part of the big draw for me is when you have your own company and you're an entrepreneur, it is the, it's like fast tracking Mm self-growth. And I think that's the part that drew it to like, I was so drawn to the growth that it really fired up within me and who I had to become to be able to grow that company, to be able to, who I had to become, to be able to become the lead manager, CEO, and all of that, I had to develop myself along the way. And it was fascinating to watch and I loved that. And that's where I, I eventually hired the coach. And, but honestly, I got to the point where I really wanted to be doing what the coach was doing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. I loved that piece. And so he started saying in my other life, I'd be a life coach. Yeah. And now look at you. Well, eventually I said, all right, I only get one life at this. Yeah. So, you know, I'm here and it just, that desire just grew to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. So you hired a life coach to help you with your leadership skills and things like that. And you said that helped you as a parent. So can you kind of talk a little bit about how, how did that help you as a parent? So basically I learned, so part of when I got coaching was really working on who you thought you were, like your thoughts around yourself, the mindset around that piece and learning that our, it was my own thoughts that were kind of directing how things went. Yeah. And so as I learned and honestly really took responsibility for the fact that my thoughts created the results in my life and my world and realizing that what they had a direct impact on what I was experiencing. And so it wasn't anyone else that had to do things for me to feel a certain way for me to do things. It was really taking that responsibility myself. So I started to realize it's not, my kids didn't have to act a certain way. My kids didn't have to do certain things for me to feel like, I was doing a good job. Right. And that was the biggest factor was I was always, I had honestly used to try to control more of what they did and how they did things. And they had to, 
behave a certain way for me to decide that I was a good mom and I had a whole bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And so once I unpacked all of that and realized that they're really kind of two separate things mm -hmm. and it's up to me to, and I get to decide how I'm going to show up and how I'm going to behave independent of what goes on with them. Yeah, that is like a big shift because I feel that a lot, a lot of the things that you said, because I do find that I do try to control things. So I, you know, I'm in control of the calendar. I'm in control of where we're going, like what, what we're eating, you know, things like that. You try and get input, but I feel like so much I'm in control of things, which also leads to burnout as a parent. I find, you know, decision fatigue, you know, I'm like, I don't right. want to make another decision like how how do you as a parent like if you were like telling me and like the listeners like how are like some little minor tweaks that you could make to maybe change those past habits or those past stories that we might be telling ourselves especially if we are feeling that way and after these last two years as a parent um you know having kids that were home virtually no sports like all of our lives shifted and you're pretty much around your kids all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how did, how do parents do that? Like, what would you say is some great advice for that? First of all, it starts with one, your feelings are kind of your indicator of what's going on. So if you're not feeling right, that actually is a good chance for you to say, okay, and then circle back to what am I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. is going on in there? Right. Cause sometimes it is a it can be small tweaks and that's what I work with a lot of parents on just realizing like your self talk and your thoughts really affect how you feel. So, for example, when you have a you know I was I honestly have been playing with this thought myself in terms of the fact like I should clean and declutter the house like who doesn't need to do more of that right? <laughs> especially now we're all home more lots going on kids home stuff right. Yeah. But whenever I honestly should in and of itself usually leads you down a road of shame yeah. <laughs> right there yeah. and because should means that you have you it's almost like you've failed before you even started, because yeah. even if you do get it done, you should have done it sooner. So true. <laughs> right? And so when you're thinking I should clean and declutter it's really defeating. And it doesn't feel great. And the last thing you actually want to do is then is clean and declutter. Right. But when you make that small shift to, you know what, in the end, what do I really want? You know what? I want to make my house beautiful. Mm -hmm. When you think of it that way, I want to make my house beautiful. You are way more inspired to actually go do something. Mm -hmm. And so the even the idea of working with parents like, oh, I, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, or you know, I shouldn't yell. And I all these different things that invites judgment. Judgment and shame shut the learning centers down in the brain. So just knowing that for yourself and for your kids. Mm -hmm. Versus when you can make that small tweak to what do I really want? You know what I want to show up is the calm, like the most calm and effective parent that I can be. And even thinking that, like your shoulders go back, you sit up more. So just even those really distinguishing to the things you think you should do to what, how can I change that to what I really want to do? Yeah. And because in the end, we think we have to do so many things. And you don't. I mean, even the point of like, oh, I have to make dinner. Well, no, you don't. You could order out. You could not feed your kids. Your kids could go hungry. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. But then it becomes a, you know what? I really want to make healthy food for my family. Like it just has a different feeling to it. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it does. It totally, I can like hear the shift even just a little bit, just what, by you saying that and, and how it can change how you react as a person. Cause it's like, it's more of like, I have to do this versus like, I want to do this. And so it's like, oh, I have to cook dinner. I have to clean. I have to walk, do the laundry. I have to versus like, or I get to, oh, I get to like, instead of like all the, you know, for me, my kids are so 
you know, we have a lot of activities after school. And so a lot of the time it's like, oh my God, I have to drive them here and I have to do this. And it's like, I get to, like, it's a privilege. Like I, I'm glad I get to like actually take my kids somewhere. I get to drive my child to travel baseball where then I get to see the parents or I get to have time in the car where I can do something of my own. I don't have to go on a watch. So I think it's also shifting those things that we as like a mom or a parent think those things, like you said, like we have to be doing, but it's like, well, you can always tweak those a little bit from like what you think you should be doing, like you said to, you know, I have to, or I get to, and I want to. Right. And cause that feeling, it, it real that feeling piece is what drives everything that you do. Yeah. So when you are that half to is, and everything you should do, it's so heavy. Yeah. And then we're not inspired to do anything. Right. I find when I get like that, like I do, I get very, I shut down, you know, like, I'm like, I just want to go in my room and like sleep. You know, I just want to mm -hmm. like reset myself because I know I'm not feeling the way that I want to feel like I, I'm a little bit on edge a little bit more. Maybe I didn't do some meditation or I didn't take some journaling time. And so when that happens to me, I'm like, I am going, I feel like I am going to like explode because I'm like all the things that I have to do. And then, you know, if my kids are acting a certain way where, like you said earlier, I feel like they should be acting another way or being grateful to me for the things that I'm doing. And it's like, they're my kids. Like they aren't going to necessarily get that. So right. then it gives me feeling a certain way. And so I kind of have to go put myself in a timeout and be like, I need to like rest on this and come back to it. Right. And there's one tool that I actually invite parents. I, I help them like when you're in that space that where you've shut down and everything seems so heavy at that point, you are in your sympathetic nervous system, which is the, that's the fight or flight one. Mm -hmm. And so there are different things that you can do to switch over to parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is your rest and digest. That's more the peace. You think uh, sympathetic S for stress, parasympathetic P for peace. Yeah. And even just like deep breaths, so I tell the parents and I give this to them to help with their kids too. smell the roses, blow out the candles. So you breathe in through your nose, out like you're blowing through a straw and you do that four or five breaths and it helps you literally like engage your vagus nerve and switch from your sympathetic to your parasympathetic. And that will help you in the moment start to bring it down. Yeah. No, that, that's a great, um, a great tool. Do you have other things that you use like in your household, like for yourself? Is that your main thing that you kind of use like for yourself? If you feel yourself getting out of alignment with what you want, or are you like good to go? Are you like, nope, I'm always good now. <laughs> no, I know. No. I use, I have a lot of different tools. Um, and just to help as I go along and some are reminders so basically as i'm going through as i'm going through the day i really work to time block and and then as i'm going into each activity just stop and think how am i thinking about this before i start it mm -hmm. so for example if i am doing something like if i'm going to be writing something if i'm thinking oh this is such a struggle for me like that doesn't help yeah. versus one of my favorites is i'm a genius I just, I'm such a genius. <laughs> it makes me giggle every time. And at times I'm like, you know what? I really am good at coming up with some great stuff. And so that will help just get me in the space where I can pull on that. If I'm intention, if I have an intention to really connect with my daughter, sometimes I'm like, okay, let's get out of my head. Cause I tend to want to have a to-do list for my kids yeah. in my head. Yeah. And so every time I'm showing up with them, it's like, especially my daughter right now is going through, she's just come through all the college application stuff. Where are you at on this? Did you do the FAFSA? Have you sent this application? And did you finish this? So literally, and she said to me at one point, you realize every time you come in my room, it's with like 20 questions. Mm. And so I myself had to stop and think, okay, you know what? Let's just take a step back. My, I, I really want to connect with her. That's my intention. And so intention is like a, it's almost like a personal GPS. You're telling your brain where you want to end up. Right. So like, okay, my intention is to connect. And, and I 
sometimes I just even have to say, okay, let's just go grab dinner together tonight. We'll go down to Sweet Greens and sit and have, she has a salad, she loves there. So let's go to Sweet Greens and just really connect, get myself out of here, out of my brain so I can really connect. But it's the, the reminders I use. Sometimes I have set reminders on my phone to pop up. And I also love little sticky notes. My kids laugh at me and they'll have friends that come over and they'll see a sticky note, a post-it note right on the refrigerator <laughs> with a question or like, be grateful or whatever I'm reminding, you know, like, what's your intention? <laughs> yeah. Different things I'm it's working on. Because, you know, I'm not sure about you. I'm going to speak uh, to myself, but, you know, if I am very scheduled or, you know, I am full with a, a full schedule throughout the day, you know, if I don't give myself that, you know, 15, 20 minutes in between, like you go from one activity to the next and you're not really thinking you're doing right. You're not really being intentional in potentially what you're working on. You're just like, okay, I'm on my to-do list. Okay. I got to work on this. I got to work on that. I got to do the next thing. So I like that how you're saying like, okay, stop for a second before you even start whatever you're getting ready to do and really think like, what is my intention here? Okay. My intention is to write this blog post, so like whatever your intention is, be there versus having your mind wander into so many other different areas, which is very hard to do. Well, just really paying attention, like, and actually, cause we have our to-do list, but the question is what result do you want to create? Mm -hmm. What is the result? And I just find that I, if I'm going by to do list and I'm just checking stuff off and I'm not paying attention to results, I'm not nearly as effective mm -hmm. as if I am really focused on, okay, what result do I want to create? This is the time that I've given myself and I'm just going to sit down and make sure like, okay, am I, am I inspired to do this? How am I feeling about this? Because if it's just a heavy and I'm rushed, it takes me twice as long, if not more to get stuff done. Yeah. And so that's that piece of like when you're checking in, like, how am I feeling? Is that feeling really when you're feeling inspired, it's like time has a different structure to it almost. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed, like you get more, you get more time, things get done more easily versus when you're hustling and stressed, there never seems to be enough. Right. Yeah. I, Cause I, then I think you can find all the little piddly things to do like around your house to the distract you. And then you're like, wait, what was I even doing with my time? You know, if you aren't like you, how you do the time blocking, I think that's really smart. But so your kids, how, how old are your kids? They are now 18 and almost 21. Oh my goodness. So are they both still at home? So my daughter is home. She's a senior okay. this year. My son is a junior in college. And so he's in Boston, so he's not too far, which is nice. So I can go in and, and he actually still likes, he'll come, he'll call and say, hey, can you come in and have dinner? Or yeah. He actually reaches out now, which is really nice. That's so great. I was yeah. going to say, just because as a mom, just in over the last, you know, two years, just how things have like shifted, you know, and just for our kids and then mental health, emotional health, emotional well-being for ourselves as parents, but also for our kids, like, did you shift at all with your, your business and your own practices because of maybe how your kids were so affected, maybe with college, like they couldn't go to their courses or they had to come home or, you know, in, in high school, you, you couldn't go to classes, you couldn't play sports. Like, how did you adjust to that? Um, knowing the things that you know about the mindset and things like that, like, did you have to help your kids shift as well or are they kind of doing all these things that you're teaching parents to do as well because they see you doing it so the good news is they have seen me change so yes one of the bad parts is that i mean when my kids my son was born in 2001 my daughter in 2003 they didn't know about brain development in children um when my kids were little yeah. And this came out later. And so I didn't have an opportunity to do what I help parents learn and do now. I didn't know. Yeah. So I have been working on helping my pit kids learn these things later in life. And but I can say, honestly, the best way I was able to do it was to teach them through what I did yeah. and through watching me and seeing me. They saw me change. They saw me go from a mom that was stressed and overwhelmed and yelled to a mom that was calm 
and talked, able to talk things through and had different types of conversations with them and literally now talks them through like what's going on in their brain and what things are, this is completely normal, but this is how your self-talk matters and how to process emotions and work through that. And so it has been a process. And I mean, during COVID, my son and my daughter were both home. Yeah. We had a lot of um, together time. And I also would, so I was, as I was teaching different things and preparing speeches, I would make them sit and listen to me and be like, guys, I'm going to run it by you first. Yeah. So smart. That, was, that was one of the ways I got them to like, start to understand some of these concepts. Yeah. Um, and really think about some of these things and then just asking them like really like how are you feeling and just being more aware and talking to them also like what's going on in their brain and how their thoughts are creating certain feelings and how to work through them and so we've just had a lot more frank conversations around that it is a it's a process they don't always remember and i have to remind a lot yeah <laughs> It's all good. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say too, I feel like, so as a parent, and so I have a 12 year old, a 15 year old, and then um, a 28 year old stepson. And so just with the evolution of technology, and again, for my process, like what I want my kids to be able to do, what other kids are doing, you know, the kind of all the different things that play into that. Well, all of my friends have this. Well, I they get to do this. Well, they're allowed to do this. And how social media plays such an emotional role, like, and kids are just so much more able to compare easily or see what other people are doing and then compare to themselves. Like, do you have good tips for, for I don't know, just like social media or just non-judgmental things that you can teach like parents to be able to teach their kids because I feel like it's so hard and there's no one right answer right there's no one right like this is the right way to parent and social and all those things but I just see such a decline in that area of like that emotional stability when you can easily access social media and comparing everyone's highlight reel you know all the teenagers and high schoolers highlight reel to like maybe what you're doing and what they're not showing versus really what's real. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a big comparison loop. And it's, you know, I just feel like it's, it's such a hard line to find as a parent, like what is right for, for your family and your kids. Right. No, it is trying to figure that out. And just the biggest thing for me was one maintaining really open lines of communication. Yeah really helping. The other thing I really worked diligently to help my kids understand was that usually when something like someone's like putting something out there, this and that, a lot of times it's their own insecurities. And if something is directed at them, like if someone directs something directly to them, it's like, listen, realize don't, I don't take it personally. Usually it's someone else's insecurities coming out. Yeah. And this is where they are feeling insecure. This is where this, and you're right. It's just letting people, letting, instructing them, like, this is the highlight reel. This isn't real life. Keep yeah. in mind, like, look at, do you put, what do you put out there? Right. And you don't put those times that you're concerned or this or that, and like those questions and all those things and just helping them also. The other thing that I really work to help parents realize is to, for their kids is the idea that their thoughts are optional. Like their brains want to, and all of us, we think we want everything that our brain gives us is just true. Yeah. And so as a parent, when you hear your child come up with something, the ability to recognize and just say, hey, let's take, take a step back. Like, okay, but is that really true? Like, oh, I'm so stupid, or I'm this, or I'm that. Yeah, but you know what? Do you really? There have been times where you've done this, this, and this, and you have done this, and that, and just being able to give them examples of other times that it's not just showing them that's not necessarily true. It's yeah. not. 
and learning to question and poke holes in the thoughts as they come up, just by asking questions, not by a lot of times, like letting them come to the conclusion on their own. They don't like being told, just like we don't like being told what to do. Yeah. And I think that's so, you know, as a, as a mom too, it's, you want the best for your kids. So it's like, oh, here's, here's what you should do. But like you said, it's like, but letting them figure it out on their own. And it's not always going to be the right answer, but they have to learn to also trust themselves um, Mm -hmm. and trust their thoughts. Because I do find myself, my kids come to me and are like, what do you think? And I'm like, well, what do you think first? Like, how would you handle this situation? What do you think you should do versus me always giving the answer? Because they're very smart, but it's like, but they also don't want to be wrong right? They want to do what's right, whatever that means or what they whatever think that means, right. Or what they think you want them to do. And I get it, but it, it's like, what do you think here? Like, well, how do you, how would you solve this problem? Cause I can easily give you what I would do because I've been, you know, 44, but what, what do you think here? What would you do? Right. And honestly, and that's the other piece that your brain will work to answer any question that you ask. Mm -hmm. So when your child says, I don't know, actually, when you say it too, I mean, this is one, I just wrote a blog on this. If I could take, I don't know out of the English language, I would drives me crazy. And I, but I still hear myself saying it. It's so ingrained in us to come up with, well, I don't know. But when we say, I don't know, our brain shuts down completely. So it stops working. So if you know when your child comes to you saying i don't know i'm like well i understand i've been might not have had time to think about it why don't you think about it what do you think you could come up with just one idea what do you think it would be Mm -hmm. and just that turning it around and getting them to start thinking and just asking questions like okay what do you like you said what do you think what is in there (laughs) what could be one first step yeah Cause I think it's and also, you know, I, I go back to phones and social media and, and Google all the different things. It's like, it's such a society where you get the answer so quickly. And so, you know, kids want to be on the go. So they don't always necessarily want to stop and think about it. They just want the answer. Like, I just want the easy way. Like, just give me the answer. Why can't you just give me the answer? And so having a moment to stop and think or process or be bored. That's what I tell my kids. Like, well, If you don't have your phone, find something to do. And if you have nothing to do, I guess you're going to be bored for a little bit. So you can go take a nap. You can go outside. You can draw. You can journal. You can just sit on the couch. But like so many times, because if your schedule is so busy, right? Busy, busy, busy. Always something to do. Then even kids need time just to be, right? not have something scheduled, but like, and not have their phone, but just let me explore. Like, do I like doing this new thing, which they're going to resist, but if they don't have the opportunity, I feel like, and I'm really talking a lot about electronics today, but I think I'm feeling that in my home. But if you don't have that and you take that away for a little bit, obviously not forever, but you know, to give them the time to explore and figure out other things versus like sitting and scrolling or watching videos and things like that, then they don't even know their own capabilities because they're just watching everybody else Mm -hmm. and watching everybody else's life versus being like exploring their own. Exactly. And that is giving the kids an opportunity to start to figure that out, start to figure out their interests and, and what's important to them and it is a yeah it it takes time (laughs) but you have to give them the time and allow you're right allow them to be bored allow them to ask oh i'm sorry go ahead no and the same goes for us yeah yeah it's so true and just giving yourself that space but and you know as a mom like i will speak honestly like they're not going to like you for it you know for me anyway it's like if you're taking or limiting or okay, this is the time frame that you have. You can do whatever you want, but like then you're gonna have this other time where you got to figure it out what you're gonna be doing. You're not gonna have that little clutch where you can log on and and do all these other things. You're just gonna have to figure it out. And kids don't always like that. 
for sure. Um, especially, you know, when a lot of kids have access all the time to whatever they want. Um, so being that parent that might have some rules or might have some boundaries uh, set against electronics and social media and technology isn't always the thing that kids like <laughs> for the most part, but I do think mm -hmm. it's something that's needed um, to give kids that space to not always be addicted and staring at a screen because again, that's not good for your brain and your eyes and everything either. No, it's not. And there's so many studies that have been done on the like, dopamine response and all the things and the addictions that come from it. And so I, I absolutely agree with you 100%. And the I always encouraged reading. And that was something that was usually I had books, we had books, I, we, I read when the kids were little. And then as they got older, it was typically books that I would read alongside with them. So I could yeah. talk to them about it. And it almost became like a race. Like, how far did you get? How far did you get? So. Right? Yeah. As your, um, you know, as your kids were little and, and, and you were, you know, starting your business and, and all that, and then moving into being a coach, how did your, your kids adjust to that? You said they noticed your, you changing, but like switching careers and things like that, like they saw you do all that. So for them, like, do they see entrepreneurial ship? <laughs> That's a hard word for me to say yeah. for some reason. Right. They see you doing that. And it's more like, oh, that's something that I could do versus I have to go to college and I have to get one of these degrees for a specific career. Yes, they um, actually, my daughter even wrote a couple English articles for English or I don't know what they're called papers and about the fact that it was a the fact that I pursued my dream later in life I I left my other career I switched and we've talked about the fact about how uncomfortable it was because I went from being the person that knew all the answers and knew what to do and all of that to being at the bottom of the rung and not having like having to figure it out and the only way to get better at coaching is to actually coach and be awful at it at first. <laughs> so we had discussions about the fact like growth isn't easy. Like you have to go through these periods of being really, really uncomfortable to get to the point like now I'm like, but now I get to do what I love. Yeah. And this is amazing. And so they have, I talk to them a lot about those changes. And I talk to them a lot about the fact like growth is uncomfortable. But usually your dreams are outside your comfort zone. Yeah. And so my daughter is, she's just looking at business, but I think she sees starting her own company someday as an option. Yeah. So it's all, it's all good. I, and I just, I'm really, I was really honest with them about the journey and how hard it was when I was in it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind, just like the journey, because I think, you know, people so much, so often see an entrepreneur um, and they think, oh my gosh, look at this life. Like, look at all the things they get to do, but they don't really know the roller coaster ride, right? Like the ups and the downs and mentally, like I feel how exhausting being, it's so exciting, but there's so many times when it's so exhausting because it's, it is that emotional roller coaster like do you mind sharing a little bit about that part of the, your journey too i don't mind so it was and i have to say one of the benefits of the fact that i was becoming a coach was i was in a coaching program with a lot of other coaches and we spent a lot of time coaching each other for practice so i coached a lot through it <laughs> so that was helpful but just being aware of what is going like i said going what's going on in your own mind so part of the like our brains naturally want to avoid what's uncomfortable if it's not safe if it's not predictable we are wired to avoid it that is how we evolved that's how the our ancestors the cavemen the ones that stayed safe were the ones that stayed alive and yeah. so that's the wiring that happened over the years and so what will happen is that our instinct is to say if it's uncomfortable like okay and we will like you mentioned we will find other things to do yeah and we'll find ourselves like avoiding the the different pieces that are going to actually take us forward just because it's uncomfortable yeah and so being able to 
recognize that's where when I mentioned focusing on results and really starting to just pay attention like okay like the this is going to be uncomfortable I know that up front so I go in saying this is going to be uncomfortable and and then I can think you know what I'm willing to be uncomfortable because I'm going after my dream yeah so instead of sitting with discomfort and trying to not wanting to do anything from there I'm sitting from like I'm uncomfortable and I'm willing to be here because I'm going after it I feel more empowered and from there I actually was able to get some things done and I just kept going and I was also I just put it out there you know what? I'm willing to fail I am going to fail what likely multiple times along the way to getting to my dreams right and I'm willing to do that and I know that I will succeed because I'm not going to give up. Yeah. So failure is just a part of it. So if you're willing to accept the fact, like, listen, some things I'm going to do aren't going to work. And that's okay. And it doesn't mean anything about me. Yeah. It's just one thing that I tried that didn't work. Right. So it has been a, it really, I've, this process has actually taught me a lot about managing my mind. <laughs> really. And watching those thoughts paying attention to that and in thinking about being really intentional about what i'm doing what results i'm creating i'm willing to keep going at this and and i could tell there was a was you know at one point probably eight months into the journey i felt the shift and it was like oh okay my nervous system finally relaxed yeah and it wasn't this constant like, what are you doing? Where like we need to go back? And it was finally like, okay, I was comfortable enough where I'm like, okay, I can do this. I know it's gonna work. We can relax now. And yes, it's still up and down, but that first, if you can get ride through that first wave and yeah. just keep going, it gets better. Yeah. It does, but managing your mind through it and being able to watch and see the discomfort for what it is like, okay, like, listen, we're okay. We just have to put ourselves out there. It's going to be uncomfortable. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah. And I think what you said too, like that there's going to be times when you have failure, but you aren't a failure, you know? So there's a big difference in that, in that like, okay, well that whatever that coaching thing that did not work right now. Like that, that course that I was going to teach, like I got to shift that a little bit, but that doesn't mean that you yourself are a failure, just like that one piece. And you got to switch it around a little bit. And what I also think is so cool about entrepreneurship. And I don't know if you've done this in your business, but like, even in your business, you can always shift. You can always adapt. You can always add new things to your wheelhouse and be like, oh my gosh, like now I want to add this to my coaching. And now I actually, I want to take it over here to this next step. Cause I've learned along the way, some mm -hmm. things and tweak some things. And I think that's really the cool thing is being open to knowing that like, you might not ever get there because you're like, oh, now there's this other piece that I can add to make it even better. And that's right. the really cool thing I think about entrepreneurship is there's no one right way. No, oh, when I started, I was gonna coach entrepreneurs. <laughs> well, there you and go. <laughs> that's what, I mean, that's what I've done for 20 years. It's what I know, I've grown businesses. I can help other people do that. I really do enjoy that. But I found as I work with them, it was kind of a, well, I've done this before, but then one of the women that I was coaching asked me if I could help her teach these concepts to her kids. And I lit up like it was nobody's business. I'm like, well, okay, that's it. So I shifted. Yeah. I'm like, all right. I had to redo uh, different things on my website, like, <laughs> just, but the shift happened and cause I knew it lit me up. And it was just, it was a passion that was there. And I really want to, I mean, I've learned so much about managing my mind and all that through the years, but to all the little pieces. And I want kids to learn this stuff at a younger age. Absolutely. And I, that's where I really wanted to be able to help parents be able to teach kids about their thoughts and their feelings and how to manage their emotions, how to, like we're not meant to be happy all the time. Right. And so, but when you start, if kids understand that at a young age, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Stress is such a big thing and can take so many years off of your life and cause so much anxiety and health issues. So, you know, learning those things, like you said, at a young age, will just be able to help them throughout their life with whatever they're going through, you know, in college. Cause I don't like how a lot of schools have led to like, everybody wins, everybody gets a trophy. Cause like that is not realistic. Like that is not real. Really? Like, and so to be teaching that, well, everybody gets a medal, whether I did anything or not, like that is not real. Like that is a scam. And so I do not believe in that philosophy because it's like, not everybody wins in life. Not everybody's going to get that job. Not everybody's going to make the team. That's real life. So um, I think going to those things like in school and gym and sports, it's like, no, oh, that is like the worst thing I feel like that you can do that yeah. everybody wins because that's not real life. No, and actually it's failing. So when failing isn't failing, actually failing is not trying. So when you can teach your kids that, listen, it was just one thing that you tried that didn't work. It doesn't mean anything. Right. And you go at it a different way and just like, okay, how can, how now can you recover from this? What do you want to do from here? And it's the, what can you learn? from this where in and granted their life is going to go may take them on a completely different direction that ended up being much better yeah and that's the one piece that i've learned over having had been on the roller coaster of entrepreneurship all these years is that typically what seems horrible in the moment ends up being a tremendous gift that i am so grateful for and so now I work on teaching my kids that like, okay, this isn't like, it seems awful right now, but in the more you stay in it being awful, the longer it's going to last. Yeah. But if you can just take a deep breath and say, okay, I'm going to trust that this is happening for me. And what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? You know, the, that's how they learn problem solving skills. That's how they learn to be more resilient. That's <laughs> it develops so many good things in them. Right. And more people, there are more people being unhappy at being unhappy than just being unhappy. But they resist the fact that they're unhappy. So <laughs> that causes more pain than just being unhappy to begin with and accepting like, oh, this is just, it's part of part of life, part of where I'm at. We're not supposed to be happy all the time. I'm just in this stage, this too shall pass. <laughs> Oh my God. All I mean, yeah, I think I can talk to you probably forever. Um, we'll have a coaching session like right here on the podcast. Um, but what is there anything that you have not shared? Because you've shared so many amazing nuggets that I know moms, just anyone in general listening to this will will be able to take away, I think, some things that they could take and do right now, like in their daily life. But is there anything that you haven't shared that you feel like you want to to kind of just share real quick before we wrap it up? Yes, actually, there is one thing that it's one important thought that I really work on helping parents understand up front. And it is the idea that kids really want to do well if they can. Most kids really want to behave. They really want to please us. They and But what's happening is that their brains aren't developed up front. And so they are born with developing, and I work a lot with helping parents develop the thinking brain, but they can't, that part of their brain that controls their emotions, that has the ability for them to be able to tolerate frustration, like all of those pieces, think through decisions, think through consequences, it's not developed yet. And so what happens is parents tend to think that their kids are choosing to misbehave. They, and, and so the concept is, it's not that they won't behave. A lot of times it's that they can't. Mm -hmm. And so just that thought alone, knowing that, okay, things are developing and I'm here to help them learn these skills. When you make those shifts in how you're showing up as a parent and you to make that tweak in how you think, of what your kid is doing and how can you then help them develop these skills versus these are choices that they're making and you have to you know <laughs> buckle down control get them to change certain ways that way that little shift can make such a difference yeah and so that is just one thing that didn't come up that i is really 
it, it's a cornerstone to a lot of what I do is helping parents like understand what's going on yeah. and help their kids to develop those skills. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, that's a great nugget. Save the best for last, I guess. <laughs> um, what is, so I always love to end with one last question because we, as women, we are so easy to support and encourage and be a great cheerleader for other people. And, and sometimes we don't look back on ourselves and see that reflected in ourselves, or we're so critical on ourselves, which you're so big about because the mindset piece, right? But what I would love to know about you right now is what is something that you love about yourself? So if you, if you think about yourself right now, what is something that you can say, like, I just love this about myself? I love, honestly, that I love to learn. I am fascinated by the process of learning new things and integrating them and I get so passionate and want to share what I'm learning with everyone else. <laughs> I get so excited. Like, and that is just one thing about me that I just really appreciate each day that I can, I'm a lifelong learner. And, and I, I love that about myself. I really yeah. do. Oh, me too. I'm a lifelong learner, but I love that. So thank you for sharing. And everyone is going to want to find you because they're going to be like, oh, I love all these parenting tips. I want to know more. I want to know how to work with you. So where can, where can people find you? Where do you hang out? Where do I hang out? So I am, my website is Mel Pierce and Pierce is backwards. It's P-E-I-R-C-E. -E. So it's Mel yeah, Pierce, not. <laughs> I know, um, melpierce.com. I am on Facebook and it is um, actually Melissa Pierce is my original one. And then you have to look, but you can get over to the Mel Pierce link. And I also have a mindful parenting circle out there, um, which is a group on Facebook that I, I run. And on Instagram, I am melpierce.coach. Awesome. And I will share all of this in the show notes too. So, you know, I'm sure like if moms are driving right now or cooking dinner and you got like beef on your hands or like cooking meatballs or something, you can't write all this down. So I will make sure that these are all in the show notes so that you can go and find Mel and, um, you know, see all the amazing tips that she's talking about, or maybe join, you know, the circle and things like that. So I've appreciated this conversation so much as a mom, um, as a friend, there's so much information that you have that I know the listeners are going to take so much away from. So I really appreciate you being here today. Oh, thank you, Melissa. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure and always wonderful to see you. Awesome. You too. All right. See ya. Take care.